It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for the next session, Lakeisha Muhammad. Motivated by a passion to help pregnant families experience safe and healthy births, Lakeisha Muhammad serves the community as a certified professional midwife, community organizer, health consultant, and professional speaker. Using her knowledge and training, she works to address and debunk myths and misconceptions, replacing them with facts and timeless traditions that lead to better decision-making and better outcomes for birthing families. She is the owner and midwife at A Mother's Worth Birth Services and the executive director of the Phoenix Birth Foundation. Lakeisha is the founder and program leader of the Arizona Birth Workers of Color. When she's not teaching, speaking, or at a birth, Lakeisha enjoys spending time with her husband, Dwayne, their three children, Amir, Yasina, and Asana, the family fur babies, Myrna, Calvin, and a bevy of hens. Lakeisha is also a very active member of the Fourth Trimester Ecosystem Advisory Board and has been an integral part of planning this summit. You can find her at a, mother, a Mother's Worth and at Arizona Birth Workers of Color on Facebook and Instagram. It's an honor to have you moderate today. Take it away, Lakeisha. Thank you, Jenny, for that introduction. And I want to say good morning and greetings to the Fourth Trimester Arizona Universe. I am so excited to be here and to moderate our first session of the day, which is birthing and postpartum practices in the Black and African American community. Before we hear from our presenter for this session, let's take a look at our financial disclosures for this talk. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce you to the speaker for this session, Iyanifa Ifa Yinka K. Lauper who we affectionately know as Ia. She takes pride in being a woman, a daughter, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a Ianifa. Ia is a third generation advocate for African-American women. For 30 years, she has worked with women from several different cultural backgrounds, both here and abroad, to wake up compassion within their hearts for African-American women. Through her work, she has been dedicated to finding ways to bridge the gaps of misunderstanding and fear, to tear down the barriers of false narratives that separate and isolate. Ia is an elder birth worker who created Afro Village Doulas, where she works side by side with her daughters, providing support for women and their families in what she calls the village style support. She currently works as a speaker, an educator and instructor with Grandmom's Way, which is dedicated to African-American women, empowering African-American women. Through her work as an Iyanifa, which is a traditional Ifa or Orisa priestess, Iya serves her community through hosting regular women's circle gatherings, community meals, and West African-based song, drum, and dance sessions with inherited Essence Creative Assembly. So welcome, Ia. It is my pleasure to introduce you to some and present you to others. We are so excited to hear from you today and take the stage, my dear sister. Thank you, Lakeisha. Greetings, everyone. How y'all doing? Um, Ia, as I was introduced and I'm um, just gonna take it away. I'm honored to be here speaking with you today. I give thanks and I give honor to Source, which is known to me as Olodumare. I give thanks and honor to my own sacred spirit, which is my Ori. And I give thanks and honor to my ancestors as I am living, breathing manifestation of my ancestors. May the words that I share serve to elevate them as well as those who receive my words in this session today. Thank you to Fourth Trimester Arizona for this opportunity to share today. I was asked to speak about birthing and postpartum practices in Black and African American communities. Please bear with me as I will not be utilizing any slides or prompts or fancy intriguing charts. I will be utilizing the sound, passion, and sincerity of my own voice. I only ask for your attention and your presence for a short period of time. Now, this is a disclaimer, y'all. I have a text here that I'm reading, but I go off text sometimes, but I'm going to try to keep it within the time limits, okay? All right, here we go. It is um, impossible for me to speak for all Black 
and African American communities. One of the most misunderstood things about us is just how diverse in culture we are as a people. It is an old and common saying where I come from that all skin folk ain't kin folk, but all folk belong to the Lord. To me, this saying is a testament to our unique genetic makeup and foundational presence acquired through the influence of enslavement, where tribal and cultural differences were not respected nor were they upheld. In the era of enslavement, if someone had melanin-rich skin, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of their culture or their tribe, they were categorized, treated, and bred as a slave. Presently, it is often assumed that within the melanated community of people originating from the continent of Africa and residing here in the United States, that there is one culture, when in fact, Although we have some shared experiences, there are many cultures. So culturally, we are as rich and as diverse as Mother Africa herself. I can speak, what I can speak to today is my own personal and possibly similar experiences as a child growing up under the skirt of a Southern grandmother who was so profound in my being that on career day in second grade, I told my class that she was a doctor and she could fix anything that was sick or broken. I was promptly reprimanded by my teacher for fibbing, but it wasn't lost on me that my grandmother was not the same type of doctor as our family doctor, who was an older black gentleman that happened to be a friend of the family. But it was the only way I knew how to put into words what it was I saw her primary work to be through my young eyes. How could I explain that all the young women in our small town community called her Mother Harris and that I witnessed them coming to her for care, advice, and even treatments of herbs and potions for their families? How could I explain that I would often witness waking up to a family who was in need being housed in our guest room? How could I explain that she and her circle of women would tell us children to go out and play somewhere while they sat and discussed all the issues of womanhood as she would wash, press, and curl their hair? How could I explain her bathing and massaging the newborns, praying over them, teaching their mothers how to care for them and watching her oiling and wrapping mothers, preparing meals, and even keeping their older children after they had given birth. This was my first introduction to the way women should be cared for and should take care of each other. I was five years old when my auntie came home to my grandmother's house with a newborn baby girl. My auntie was young, and she was unwed. But in our culture, regardless of her being categorized statistically as a failure, her being pregnant and giving birth was considered a great blessing and it was a reason to celebrate. I remember before she left to give birth, all my other aunties who were actually other women in our community were helping her to get things ready for the hospital where she had chosen to give birth. In our culture, any woman who is old enough to be your mama is referred to as auntie, and that's out of respect. I remember my mother took on the task of braiding her sister's hair, which seemed to be very important. So after my newborn cousin was born, I remember watching as my grandmother prepared the house for my auntie's arrival home. She was setting up a bassinet with diapers and onesies and socks for the baby and preparing a space for my auntie to sleep downstairs, saying that she didn't want my auntie to have to climb up the steps and she certainly wasn't climbing up them steps and she needed to keep an eye on her. So once they arrived at my grandmother's house, I remember the women would come and they would sit and they would talk. One after the other they came. They were making over my little cousin, 
commenting on who she looked like and how good of a baby she was. But they never touched her face. They never touched her hands. And they didn't offer to hold her. They would speak their words of encouragement from my auntie. And they never came empty handed. My grandmother took care of my auntie. And my auntie took care of her new little baby girl. I remember feeling how lucky we were to have grandmom because auntie didn't have to be alone and grandmom knew what to do. I believe that this is a familiar narrative in most black and African American cultures. Even if there was not a grandmom who took on the role of taking care of the women, there was an auntie, an elder woman who lived nearby, and lots of recognition and care for new life. Birth was joy. That is what I remember. It was like a secret women's society. It was not political, nor did it seem scary. It was supported and it was celebrated. Okay, I'm going to move on to speaking about the present. That was the past. Now we're going to go move into the present. Okay. As Black women, we have this inherent understanding that pregnancy and birth is deeply spiritual. Throughout the first, second, third, and fourth trimesters of birth, a transformation is being made where the mother is standing between two worlds, two realms, two realities, with her womb serving as a portal. With each phase of this process, bringing its own challenges and its own triumphs. Although that may sound a little science fiction to some, we as black women have had the secrets of this understanding passed down to us from our mothers for many generations in some way or another. Some things that have been passed off as silly old wives tales are coded messages of how one realm influences the other. For example, don't talk about nobody's baby being ugly while you're pregnant. Otherwise, you will have an ugly child. This is in recognition of the belief that whatever spirits the mother engages in directly influences her developing child. In my experience as a birth worker, one of the best ways to adequately support and serve the birthing mother through this process of transformation is to first have some knowledge of where she comes from by either being part of, of or connecting with her circle of women. I believe that taking the time not only to get to know her, but also helping to create a solid team of support for her is paramount. We cannot and we do not neglect the very important step of building relationships with the mother and her family. Every woman has a story. In her story, we are informed about her. We must take the time to listen in order to understand. As birth workers, we become another resource in an already established foundation. In acknowledgement of the spiritual side of this journey, we have learned to pay attention and listen to her dreams. And we don't dismiss her feelings. We understand that sometimes her hopes and her fears are encoded in her dreams and are encoded in her feelings. We do not speak negatively about pregnancy or birth. We use the power of our spoken word to speak life and to speak encouragement. This is important to help empower and nurture her spirit throughout this transformation period. It also helps with our voice becoming a trusting voice when it is needed. So, you know, when mom is in the throes of pushing, for example, if I have that trust with her, I can look her in the eye and I can say, it's going to be okay, baby. You all right. And my voice is heard because I've taken that time 
to speak life and encouragement and goodness to her so that trust has been established. And my voice is a trusted voice now. When the time for giving birth comes, it is important for the women to gather. Sometimes this happens in person. Sometimes there are selected few who are in the birthing space. Sometimes through technology, some are present. If physical distance is a factor, candles may be lit, prayers and affirmations may be spoken, and we keep vigil. If in proximity, we gather with the intention of providing a safe spiritual bubble and give the gift of comfort measures for the mother. This can be done through voice, through touch, through movement, or through silence. I've personally been in situations where that spiritual bubble has been so tight, that safety net, that anyone who was entering that, wanted to enter that space with any negativity just did not feel comfortable. Nurses, people who thought they was going to come up and visit and all this other kind of stuff for come in, they come, they look, and they turn right around because it's tight in that space. And that's what our goal is. Okay, after baby is born, once everyone has expressed their joy and all the helping hands have fed mama and helped to get baby fed, whether it's through the breast or through the bottle, if the help is needed, we make sure mama's comfortable in her body as much as possible after giving birth. And we have learned that the best way to support is to give the grace of allowing for personal bonding and rest. This is extremely important to the spiritual and emotional well-being of the new bond. So we have to have the wisdom and we carry the wisdom of knowing that our work here is, is complete. Now this is a space of rest for mother, for baby, for the immediate family to come together and to bond. And so we know how to step back and give the space. We don't hang around talking about the weather and, oh, what you going to do next and all of that. We get out of the way and we allow for that. This is very important. I have also learned that one of the most important ways to support women through their transformation into motherhood is the gathering of their circle of women to celebrate the joy of new life. So now I'm going to speak about several ways this is done in my culture. One of the first things we do when we realize there is new life coming is to inform the elder women of the family. So in my culture and our family, when that pregnancy test comes back positive, we call in mama, grandmama, aunties, great aunties. Oh my God. Oh my God. We do that. <laughs> The importance of this though, is so that they can offer prayers and they can offer guidance. So when the elders in the family are called, they immediately give a prayer for the safe coming of this journey of this baby to earth, of this spirit to come to earth and for there to be a healthy pregnancy and for mom to get all the things that she needs. And this is what we do in return. So it's an, it's an exchange there. That's very important. Okay, after the mother is well into her pregnancy, we organize what's called a mother shower for first time mothers, where all the mothers in the community gather, prepare a light meal, and give the gift of sharing their wisdom around birth. So what we do here is we host what we call like a tea or less like a light brunch or something. Um, usually it's a tea, but we all come together and the gift, the gifts that are given are the wisdom of the elder women. And in this instance, it's going to be anyone who is a mother. So we invite all the mothers of the family to come to this. And then they share uh, just whatever wisdom they would like to share with the new mom. One of my favorite stories is my, my youngest daughter, when she was pregnant with her first son, and we, we held her, her mother shower. And we all are telling her all these, you know, many wonderful things. And then one of my sisters said, girl, there's the ring of fire. 
There is the ring of fire. Your coochie going to burn. It's going to burn, girl. And that's okay. Everything's all right. It's going to burn. It might, that might happen. And we, none of us had thought of that. And we were like, okay. But when my daughter was giving birth, she had the ring of fire. And she was like, oh, my goodness. I have to let you know that that happened. So, for example, you know, you'd be surprised when you all gather together that information that everyone brings, that wisdom that everyone brings, you never know where it's going to fit, where it's going to sink in. It's valuable. No matter how small it may seem, it's not insignificant. We also make sure to check in with mom on a regular basis to see how she's feeling. This is very important that we don't neglect mom. It's like, oh, you pregnant. Okay, I see you when the baby gets here. We check in. Someone usually offers some kind of support through food and drink, either by preparing meals for the family or making sure mama is provided with easy on the belly light foods in the beginning and hearty stews for after birth. We also make sure to lay eyes on her. If there are children, someone usually takes up the responsibility of helping with them. So, this is where aunties and good girlfriends come into play because as we all know, sometimes in the beginning of pregnancy, moms are needing to sleep a lot, needing to get that rest to help grow the baby. And so we try to make sure that somebody is checking in at least once or twice a week. How's she doing? What's going on with those kids? What kind of help do they need? Um, you know, is, is, is the partner okay? Are they good? You know, what's the work schedule like? we're very involved so that we're able to help this family adjust to mom being tired, mom being possibly not feeling well with, you know, uh, sickness from pregnancy and things of that nature. So it's kind of like, again, I love to say many hands on deck. We all get on deck and the more people you have, it's, it's less time. So in other words, if there are four of us, we can rotate where one of us check in once a week. You know, and so it's not saying that it's so time consuming. And this is something I'll speak about a little bit further down, which is about birth workers working together, um, taking on this kind of a model so that we don't have burnout. Okay. In my culture, we do our best to make sure mom is being complimented. We speak life by reminding her of the beauty and the glow of carrying and creating new life. This is important because a lot of times moms feel they ugly, they fat, my back hurts, I ain't doing my hair, I don't feel like this today. And when you have that voice of someone who you know loves you and say, you know what, you got this, you are doing this, look at you glowing girl, oh my goodness, I see you over there, you got that pregnancy glow, we have a thing about that pregnancy glow. You got that pregnancy glow going on. Um, that weight look good on you, honey. Don't worry when you have the baby. If you want it off, breastfeeding to help you. You know, we have all our little sayings, but we want to make sure that we're speaking life. We don't want to say, oh, girl, you huge. Oh, Lord, child, look at them ankles. What you going to do about... No, we don't do that. <laughs> we don't do that to mama. We speak life into her. Me personally, I have given thanks to my daughters and my daughter-in-law. I see them carrying my grandchild and I'm like, thank you. Thank you so much. Look at you carrying my grandbaby. I can't wait to meet them. You're doing such a good job. You are beautiful. I make sure to do that because I am very happy and understand that they are carrying me inside of them, a part of me inside of them, and taking really good care of me. Every time they eat something healthy, every time they think something good, every time they have a smile on their face, that is feeding my spirit, that's feeding my DNA, that's being carried inside of them as well, and I thank them for that. And this is a big part of our culture. We also make it a habit of speaking to the child growing inside. So we do that too. Oh my goodness, you're growing in there. Would you about the size of a peach now? <laughs> so we do that as well. At some point before the birth of the baby, we get an idea of what is important for mom when giving birth. So because we are being close with her and spending time with her, naturally she's going to share some of the things that she'd like to see for herself in giving birth. 
um, I've had moms. I want to, I think I want to squat. I've seen that somewhere on YouTube where if you squat, you know, it's easier to get the baby out or, you know, I was thinking about, you know, having my husband hold my legs or, you know, I think I want my mama to do this. They'll start to share things about what they would like to see. And so we have an idea because, you know, we're close to them. Mom will feel comfortable sharing this type of information with us because we're close. And we're connected and we're well informed when we do this. Okay, we've walked this journey beside her. And so supporting her is natural. It's not like, I don't really know this mom. I don't really know her all like that, but I'm going to come in here in the most important times of her life and help her. We've walked this journey beside her. So when it's time to come to support her in this. It is a natural bond and connection. There's no preconceived idea of what will happen in the birthing space. Whatever happens, we are well prepared to move with respect for her needs. It is easy to support her because we have been doing so all along. So we find our places and we sink into them. And what I mean by that is some of us, we understand that our place, our space is not in the birthing space. Our place may be with the children. Some of us need to be right next to her side, being that encouraging voice in her ear as she's laboring. Some of us just need to be sitting there crocheting a blanket, just having our presence in the room. Some of us need to be the one that the doctors know that if they need to say something, they can look to us or we're really close with the midwife. And so we can like talk to the midwife outside of the room. Some of us do really well with massage and rub, and we naturally know where we're supposed to fall into place because we've been developing this all along. In my culture, after a baby is born, it is common practice for usually an elder woman to keep the eye on the family by staying close, by checking in with them each day, or staying at the home with the family. This is usually a grandmother if possible, who also gets the honor of giving the baby their first bath and their newborn massages. We provide warm foods and drinks. We do not give anything cold nor anything freezing to the mother. We help with herbal sitz baths. We give postnatal rub downs and wraps, which is for blood stimulation and for support. All of that being said, there is no roadmap of how that support looks because every woman, every pregnancy, every birth experience is alive and different. Mainly, whatever is needed is met and it is usually a few people who work together to meet what the needs are. So it isn't just one person who's there doing everything. There are a few of us working together. A few unique practices in my culture are how we handle the placenta. We do not consume it at all because we believe that it is as part of the spirit of the child and that it should be buried. This is usually done by a male member of the family. We keep the baby's head covered and we believe that outside of the parents, only the elder mothers in the family should be handling the newborn baby. We celebrate the birth of the newborn with a naming ritual and a big celebration. Lots of food, drumming, singing, dancing, welcoming this baby Earthside. And this is when we also reveal this baby's name. And it is also custom in my family and my culture for the child to provide a gift for the mother on their birthday. So in my culture, we actually say happy birthday to the mother, not just the child because a mother is born. And, an, and it doesn't matter, I'm a mother of eight children, I have nine birthdays, okay? Because I became a different woman each time I gave birth. And so that happy birthday is for me all throughout the year. Um, I earned that, I earned that y'all. And every mother earns that. And what we do in our culture is the child gives a gift to the mother. Um, I give my mother gifts on my birthday. And because my sister who's 11 months younger than I and passed away when she was 27 is no longer here. I also gift my mother on her birthday to remind her 
um, the gratitude for our very life, our very breath that we have on this earth. If she didn't do what she did, we would not be. And so it is a reminder of gratitude and it's common in my culture. All right, y'all, this is the last part. This is about the future. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm not going to be too long. All right. <laughs> You're doing great. Oh, thank you, Lakeisha. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I realized about two years ago that focusing my energy on the devastating realities of Black maternal and infant mortality in this country was crippling me. It left me with a sense of despair. I shed a great deal of tears. I felt angry about the amount of neglect due to personal and systemic racism towards Black women who were being robbed of the joy of giving birth comfortably. I personally lost a grandson. He was stillborn due to the negligence of a midwife, of a white midwife. So I was very angry and disheartened. But since that time, I have focused on the many ways we as Black women who are dedicated to supporting Black women who are birthing mothers can help to bring a sense of strength and celebration to this narrative. I am tired of hearing about us dying. I want us to do something about it. I want us to be able to look at this as strength and celebration and joy. I wonder what we could actually do to change the outcomes. I have found that the ways of our grandmothers who knew how to gather around the joy of birth is a key element. There is this understanding of strength in numbers. There's this wisdom around many hands making light work. There's comfort in having a village of women offering support by each bringing their own unique way of doing so. So it's nice that I know how to prepare a nice soul food meal. I can get in the kitchen y'all and I can cook up a wonderful meal. I can do it. But when I'm in the kitchen with my daughters and my daughters-in-law and someone is making those yams and somebody else is dealing with that macaroni and cheese and I can focus on frying that chicken and the fish and someone else has got those collards, that all our love and our goodness and us singing together in that kitchen and listening to our music and dancing is all up in that food. It is beautiful. There is wisdom in that. And that is something that I learned from my grandmother and a lot of us have learned from our elders and which is a way, a unique way with black and African American women that we know about. We know how to do y'all. This is what we used to do all the time in the past. What I would like to see for the future is birth work returning to the hands of the women in our own women's circles. Imagine if a birth worker was just as important as that one sister friend who knows how to get all the deals on events and vacations, or that one auntie who knows everything about beauty and fashion. I would like to see the wisdom of the elders, which is essential to our well being, being passed on to be understood and practiced without shame and without prejudice. I want us to feel comfortable being us again and taking pride in the way we do things. I would like to see birth workers who enter sacred spaces of established bonds to enter those spaces respectfully and generously. I would like to see birth workers come together by joining together to provide that empowering women's circle if for some reason it is missing for a mother. I think it is critical for us to take the time to build relationship with and get to know each other and share our strengths so that we can rally together to work for the families in our communities. I'm speaking about the birth workers, getting together, getting to know each other. We have to learn to make space for each other in a world where very little space has been made for us because supporting birth is a vital part of who we are and it is how we have survived regardless of our cultural differences. It is worth taking the time to take on the task 
of learning the beauty of working together to avoid burnout, contempt, despair, and greed in what we are doing. This way, we will know who makes the healing stews. We know who has the calm spirit suited for the birth space. We know who does well with effectively communicating and working with the extended family. We know who does well with massage. We know who does well with postpartum care. Working together, we would be an unstoppable force of support, which would be paramount in bringing communal joy back into the work we have been called to do. These are the practices that I desire to see moving forward in the Black and African American pregnancy and birth support roles. I believe this is how we move forward and we do our part in making a change. I appreciate you taking this journey with me today. I appreciate your patience in hearing my words as I have shared my personal experience, my shared experiences. Thank you so much. Okay, Lakeisha. I don't know what's next. Maybe questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So we've asked everybody to place their questions in the chat. And while we're giving space for that to happen, oh, yeah, I have to personally say this was incredible. Thank you so much for what you shared. You've been able to articulate for me as a Black birth worker what I've wanted to say for years, what my heart has desired for years in this work. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, you are welcome. Yeah. So just to give you a little feedback of what's going on in the chat, I know that's hard to keep up with as you're speaking, but there is so much co-signing and bearing witness going on to really? everything that you have said. Absolutely. You've got folks in tears. They are throwing their hands up and yes, yes, yes. We want more. There are a request for you to write a book. Jeremy said he's waiting on your book for supportive birth stories. Um, so you started on that right away. <laughs> I have two books on the blog. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wonderful. So we'll have to put that link in the chat to your blog, which is amazing. I've read several posts that you've recommended to me and I need to do a deep dive myself. <laughs> so at this point, Raquel, do we have any questions in the chat? No, I think you covered it all. It was all just a lot of support and praise to what she was saying so great information thank you so much well while we have a little bit of time and we're waiting to see because some folks are, are after processors like me it takes us a minute to take it all in and formulate our questions i would ask ia can you share more on mother showers versus baby showers what yeah. are your thoughts around that in our culture all right y'all i'm not a fan of baby showers um, I'm not a, a fan of baby showers because a lot of times I think the essence of the spiritual journey of what birth is gets lost in just buying material things. And I feel like that is something that families are going to hook up anyway. I'm a grandmother. If my grandbaby need diapers, I'm getting the diapers. I don't really need to invite a bunch of people to come and, and shower, you know, my daughter with diapers, for example. But what is important, and I think sometimes which is overshadowed by the material wanting to give material things, is the joy and the beauty and the essence of sharing this gift of wisdom from people who have already experienced carrying a child and giving birth. It's very important, I think, to pass those gems on. Um, it's not often that a, a great auntie will sit down and speak about her experience of giving birth to her great niece, for example. But if we make space for that and we make room for that, it is a gem, it's invaluable information that's that can be given. So we're making space for that to be the gift. And these are gifts that that won't be gone after a poo is done, you know? It's like, that's gonna stick with mom um, forever. And something that she may even pass on to her, her great niece or her granddaughter. And so it's a way of keeping those family birth stories preserved and passed on, as well as giving this this wonderful gift that's invaluable to mama. And that's the difference, I think. 
I agree. <laughs> and thank you for sharing. That is incredible information for us to have, especially in our culture where baby showers are so prevalent. And now even the gender reveals are, yes. you know, a big, well, we're all focusing on the baby, on the child, which is important. But what about the mother? What about the mama? And yes. as you said, not focusing on those material things, but on that wisdom that we can share. Yes. All right. So we do have one other question in the chat here. How do you feel about non-Blacks using these steps and tools to prepare for birth and during birth? And that comes from Michelle Ponce. I, I, so as I stated when I started out and I said there's many cultures, even within the Black and African American community, I'm a big person of stick to what you know and what has been given to you. I personally feel like I don't like the, oh, what is the right terminology for it? I'm going to run over and steal something from over here because I heard about it and it sounds good. It it lacks the wisdom of what it is. When someone gives you something from them, it has the full scope of the wisdom behind it. So me personally, I, I people can do whatever they want to do in those spaces, but it's going to feel different. If you don't really truly have the essence and the understanding around something, then it's more like a mimicking or mockery of it. I think it's really important that if you're going to actually implement something and, and put it in that it's in your bones, that it's in your blood so that you're not lost. It's the issue that I take with sometimes a lot of black women who want to become birth workers that go to organizations outside of speaking with another black woman who's saying, listen, this is what your great, great grandmama did. You know, I'm going to go and now I'm going to start doing all this stuff because I'm being told that it's good for birth. And so we're taking a, it's taking away from the essence of what's even calling you to do the work in the first place, which I believe is ancestral and I believe is spiritual at its essence. And then it filters down and manifests in this material way. And so when you kind of, you know, come in with that sort of, I'm just going to say a colonized way of thinking about doing things, I think it strips away from the essence um, of what you're able to give. I think it's worth it to dig back into your own culture because I'm here to tell you women, we've been doing this for a long time in every culture and every race we've been doing this. So I think it's worth it to dig back into your own culture, to dig back into your grandmother. How did y'all do things? Your great grandmother researching that and bringing that because you're, it's going to fulfill something in you that is just not going to fulfill if you are dealing with someone else's bloodline, culture, ancestral heritage. And that's just the way that I feel about it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for sharing that. Jenny, I see you have your hand up and then we have one other question in the chat. Thanks, Akisha. Yeah. Wow. Like this was, <laughs> this was so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this wisdom. I think, uh, yeah, we have like an internal team chat and we were all bawling. So your, your wisdom and, um, your depth of knowledge and, and, um, strength and really just grounding in what this really is, you know, for you and your culture is, um, it's so inspiring, but it's more than that. It's, it's amazing. So thank you so much for being willing to share with us today. It, um, it really warmed my heart and, and to hear, you know, these amazing things happening for, um, mothers in your lineage is just, it's, it's so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for giving us this gift of speaking here today. You're welcome. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, Jenny. I'm happy to do it. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much, Jenny. We also have a question in the chat from Kira Harvey, who is a young budding birth worker who is a doula and getting her feet wet in the field. And she asked, are there specific roles for a sister, auntie, mother-in-law in the birthing process? Yes. Um, as I stated, you know, when I was um, speaking, I feel like it's a natural process and it's different, right? Some mothers and daughters have really, 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 really close relationships where, you know, 
daughter just want to be up under mama all the time, all throughout her life, through everything, through getting married, through having her babies, after they're born. And then there are some daughters that are kind of like independent, like mommy, advise me from over there. Um, the importance with birth workers of getting to know the mama, and this is why I said it, is so that we understand this. It's not always appropriate to bring in mom and be like, okay, mom, you're mom. So naturally you should do this. If you have knowledge and understanding of that relationship, then those kinds of roles aren't like set in stone and then someone steps into them. It's more like honoring what's already true and already there and making a full picture out of that, where it might be an auntie who's closer to that mother who's given birth that can come in in the way that we might think a mother would. But, you know, we, we understand this in our different cultures, right? We know that sometimes it's an auntie who's closer to this one, and then that one's closer to grandmama, and then these two sisters are close, but she don't really like her all like that. And this one, you know, we, we kind of get these different dynamics. And so it's sort of like supporting what's already there and using that intelligence, that wisdom to get the best result so that she's comfortable. If I, if mama is trying to give birth, we don't want to now have to have her in her head. Like why y'all got my mama up in here rubbing my feet and I don't want this woman touching me. <laughs> you know, We, we, we don't want that. So I'm hoping that that's answering your question where I say, yes, there's always room, but there's room with with regard and respect to what is already established. It's about respecting that and kind of honoring that. Does that answer your question, Kira? And you can answer in the chat. Yes, it does. Thank you, beautiful. Um, thank you for the question. So as we wrap up here, there's one more thing I wanted to throw out there just to get some clarity on, because this was huge in my culture growing up in the South, in South Carolina, not touching the baby's face, hands, or holding, and especially kissing the baby. Now that was considered pretty vile. If you, <laughs> So you can you just speak a couple more minutes on, on that aspect? <laughs> Yes. Okay. So the baby, we don't, we don't handle someone else's baby. Um, <laughs> the parents handle the baby, the grandmothers, the grandparents handle the baby, um, extended family. When that baby first comes here, we just, we don't do it. We, we don't have other people's germs. Now, you know, I'm going right back to my grandmama, y'all. We don't want all them folks germs on this baby. And, um, you know, they don't be kissing on this baby. You don't touch this baby's hand. You don't fondle. You don't hold. Um, this person is, you know, just coming earth side. And whatever spirits that other people have is believed that they, are, you know, those spirits are someone, you know. So, so first of all, the baby's coming. We feel like they've just arrived from spirit world. And so they're very vulnerable and very sensitive to different spirits, different attitudes, different feelings, um, absorbing that. And so what they, what we want to do is build that cushion, keep that cushion around that baby. We don't want just any old body coming in here with their, you know, their different um, attitudes, feelings, spirits, and kind of dumping that um, onto this new child. We want to make sure that that baby is cushioned with what is familiar and being brought into their family dynamic. Um, you know, we we bring in the siblings. Like there's just a whole line of people that have to be introduced to and the baby has to be introduced to and made to feel comfortable with before we get to my friend down the street who heard there's a baby. It's okay to come by and bring your goodwill with you but it is inappropriate in our culture to touch the baby, to say, oh, let me hold the baby. It's like, we all will give you a look like, what? Mm -mm, that baby ain't leaving his mama. And if mama, if it needs to leave mama, it ain't coming to you, you know? <laughs> That's just something that has been handed to me personally from my grandmother um, about babies. And so I just knew this growing up as a child, um, and you know, when I would ask her about it, she said, we don't need all them folks touching on this baby. We don't need their germs and germs, not only meant, you know, germs, but she's talking about spirits as well. 
Thank you for that. Yeah, same teaching went on in my household. Absolutely the same. Again, thank you so much for everything that you shared today. This was just an incredible session as I knew it would be. <laughs> I knew it. Um, so we want to thank everyone who asked questions or participated in the session today. Take a moment, reflect, share your aha moments and your takeaways in the chat. Share your favorite AZ organizations, resources, practitioner, family supports, and advocates in our community board over on Whova. Not only can you build your network and connect with others, you earn points. You earn points over on Whova in order to win a prize. I'm kind of competitive. I might have to go over and see what that's about. And it says there's some awesome prizes. So at this point, we will take our first break for the day to connect and socialize we are going to gather back here at 10 a.m for our session on integrating mental health into primary care for parents and children so thank you all so much we'll see you back at 10.